I'll call the meeting to order and then pass it over to Veronica for our meeting rules. Okay. Let me share my screen. Let me know if you can see my screen. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Veronica Sun and I'll be your technical host for tonight's evening. Uh, thanks for joining us for today's meeting. Uh, to start off with a few housekeeping rules. This meeting has been called to conduct the business of the city of Boulder. Activities that disrupt, delay, or otherwise interfere with the meetings are prohibited. The time for speaking or asking questions will be limited to three minutes. No person shall speak except when recognized by myself, and no person shall speak for longer than three minutes. Each person shall register to speak at the meeting using their real name. Any person believed to be using a name other than the one they are commonly known by will not be permitted to speak. Uh, if you are joining in with uh, your phone, you will need to press star six to unmute and star nine to raise your hand. No video will be permitted except for city officials, employees, and invited speakers. All others will participate by voice only. I will enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates them. The chat function is enabled for tonight's meeting and will be used for individuals to communicate with the host myself. It should be used for technical or online platform related questions. If an attendee attempts to use the chat for any reason other than those Stated, the city reserves the right to disable that individual's access to chat. Only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share their screen during this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. First up, we have the approval of the June 2022 minutes. Hope everyone got a chance to review those. Does anyone have any edits that they would like made? Not seeing any, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes as is. Move to uh, approve the minutes as is. I'll second that. All those in favor? Looks like we have a 3 0 vote. Oh, Trini, four. Thanks, Trini. Okay. Third item on the agenda is public comments. Tonight, we have two public hearings, one about the capital improvement program and one about the downtown Boulder Station. If you're here tonight to talk about those, we will, I'll ask that you hold off until we get to those items on the agenda. But anyone wishing to speak about anything transportation related to the board, um, now is the time to do so and you'll have up to three minutes if interested. Uh, if you're interested, use the reaction tool at the bottom of the frame to, to raise your hand. And Veronica, I see Garrett has his hand raised. All right, Garrett, I'm gonna ask you to unmute and then I'll do a three minute countdown. Um, could you confirm that you were able to unmute before I start the countdown? I am unmuted right now. Can you hear me? Perfect. Okay, three minutes starts now. Thank you very much. Uh, I am sort of wanted to bring an issue uh, to your attention that I am sort of becoming increasingly frustrated by in the sense that I live in Gun Barrel on a city street that is increasingly being saturated with commercial vehicle traffic who are seeking shortcuts around the Diag and other ways uh, that are becoming increasingly congested. Uh, I just am at my wits end here because I, this street I live on crosses uh, an open space trail. And, you know, there are people crossing this uh, often. And when semi trucks, large vehicles with trailers, uh, you know, present a pretty real hazard. And I can tell you, like, the amount of vehicles going down here at speeds that are well in excess of the speed limit. And even if they were traveling at the speed limit, they would not be able to stop in time to avoid a pedestrian or biker. Uh, you know, and I sort of did a little bit of legwork in the sense that I was looking for 
guidance on whether or not Boulder has a truck route or anything uh, for routing commercial vehicles like Longmont does. And I could find no such regulations. Uh, and it's kind of concerning to me because, you know, as Boulder is being sort of built around by other, uh, you know, municipalities uh, and townships, you know, there is an increasing amount of traffic and, you know, the amount of UPS trucks, FedEx trucks, freight trucks uh, that are all using this city street that has residences on it. Uh, I just don't know, you know, what is my recourse here? It's, I don't know who to ask or who to talk to. And there's really not much guidance uh, in the sense in terms of city regs. So it's just kind of here I am, you know, counting vehicles in the hundreds that are going by on a daily basis that are, you know, a nuisance to me, but also a hazard to people using this trail. Uh, and I can pretty much count every day uh, I hear the squeal of tires from a vehicle uh, coming to that crosswalk, finding a, a pedestrian there or a biker. And, and on more than one occasion, I've had to almost break up fist fights between people. So like, this is clearly a place where there is a lot of uh, tension and I am seeing an increasing amount of truck traffic. And I don't understand why they're using this street as a way to uh, you know, go by. You know, the amount of garbage trucks alone and it isn't garbage day, you know, six days a week. So I'm just curious, uh, you know, why I, I sort of have to put up with this and what I can do to sort of like stem this, or am I just sort of stuck uh, in sort of being a uh, interstate for commercial traffic? So I, and that I will yield my time. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Garrett. Do you, sorry to hear about this. Do you mind sharing which street the truck traffic is on? Yeah, I live on North 71st, so it crosses the Lobo Trail. Okay. And Thanks. it runs to uh, 52, where there's a giant sign that says, you know, welcome to the city of Boulder. You know, there's photo radar. So it's pretty clear signage that it's a city street. So anyway, thanks. Thank you. Let's see, Lynn Siegel has her hand raised. All right, Lynn, I'm gonna ask you to unmute and your three minutes begin now. I was just at the town hall meeting for the police, just ready to speak there, but I can't be in two places at once. So I don't know how to avoid this. Um, but um, I was riding my bike today um, out to my comparative um, property for the Board of Assessment Appeals with the state to, to fight my property taxes on Wicklow, which is out of your district. I know it's not in the city of Boulder. It's before 95th and on Arapaho. It's right off Arapaho. And it was, um, I, where does the city end? Can you tell me? Is it 75th? Is it before 75th? The city uh, border margin? I don't want to tell you about stuff that's problem outside of your district. You know, I'm just trying to do the right thing here. Can't tell me where the city ends. Sorry, Lynn, is Lynn talking about Arapaho and 75th? That, yeah. That's outside of the city of Boulder boundary. Okay, um, 65th is in. 63rd where does it end like what's it's around and Garrett can help um but Lynn we're taking we're taking up your time so I, I want to be mindful of that yeah um in any case um I I'm finding the shoulder is like a foot in places and then it shrinks to be less than a foot and I'm riding my bike I'm 70 years old in April of 23 and um these big hauler trucks are coming by and you know western disposal and construction stuff and cement trucks and major stuff with with a very narrow um shoulder for me to ride my bike and i'm i'm trying to not drive my car but I don't see how that's very possible when I'm going east out of city limits. So maybe you need to consult with the county about the shoulders being wide enough. And in one place, the shoulder was even eviscerated, you know, like the asphalt was. So I had to go inside the white line um, just to, you know, get 
continue on my route. Um, and this is like pastoral, beautiful country. Like it's like Sonoma Valley out there and like people can't really ride their bikes out there. So I was just wondering if um, anything can be connected with the county to produce something more feasible. And also still the Whittier fire is a problem. Every time I'm going um, west on, um, on Pearl, um, I'm suddenly in the street and I don't like competing with cars and, and with, you know, that's just not reasonable for older folks, especially. So thanks. Thanks, Lynn. Does city staff want to provide some insights about what's going on on Arapaho, both in the city? Oh, I see. Uh, we'll, we'll get to Kurt, Kurt Nordbeck next, and then maybe staff can provide a response about Arapaho and then the truck traffic on 71st. All right, Kurt, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself, and I'm starting your three minutes now. Okay, sounds good. I just wanted to uh, speak briefly on behalf of Community Cycles about 3825 Walnut Street. You should have received an email from us. Basically, we feel that it's important that the uh, North-South connection be maintained between Walnut and, and um, Frontier as envisioned in the uh, Transportation Connections Plan, but we don't feel that it need be a full-on street. We think that a multi-use path would be an appropriate compromise. We understand that crossing the, the railroad tracks is, is a problem, but if we don't reserve this right of way now, then it's gonna go away and there's no way to ever get this connection. So uh, we feel that some connection is important, but it need not be a full on street connection. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. If there are no other people interested in speaking during public comment, I'll turn to city staff if you have any response to any of these uh, comments we heard. Sure, thanks, Alex. Um, so for 71st, that's something we can look into to, and, and Garrett, I see just popped on. I know there was some conversation about 71st with the county and I'm not sure, Garrett, are we, are we still, is that part of our system still? Yeah, I'll just state my name and title for the record, Garrett Slater, Principal Transportation Projects Engineer. So uh, the county has approached the city about the possibility of doing a swap uh, for East Baseline Road and uh, North 71st, and we have not yet made a determination uh, uh, with regard to how to proceed there. But that is up for consideration. I, I would just say that uh, there are uh, portions of 71st that are uh, under the control of the city and portions that are not. But uh, we work with the county very closely in those areas where there's meandering boundaries. And we uh, can take a further look into what steps can be taken for safer um, bike and pedestrian crossings of 71st. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Garrett. And then for Arapaho, so our limits, and Garrett can confirm this, I believe it's like at 63rd. Um, there's a kind of a neighborhood street um, on the north side where the city limits end, and then it becomes county east of there. Um, and then there was a question, or was there a question about kind of um, multimodal projects on, along that corridor? Um, so we, and we can certainly share more information with Lynn around, um, the state highway seven regional work that's happening, um, and the work that we're doing in our plans with East Arapaho. Garrett, did you have anything specifically that you wanted to share related to the state highway seven regional work? Just that uh, the work is continuing in terms of the planning and design efforts to consider all modes of travel. Um, and providing for um, better choices uh, because it's pretty clear to anyone who's experienced uh, the sections east of 75th Street that uh, the choices become pretty limited um, from that point eastward. So uh, I can appreciate the concerns that were raised and that's uh, the type of uh, um, concerns that are being uh, considered as the, the preliminary design moves forward. 
And Len, I think under matters from staff tonight, we'll have an update from Nathan about the multi-use path within the city limits on, on East Arapaho. That's right. Seeing no more hands up, we'll move on to our first public hearing of the night. It's on the 2023-2028 capital improvement program. City staff will provide the board with a presentation and we'll be able to ask some clarifying questions. After that, we'll open it up to a public hearing and then there'll be some tab deliberation and a, and a formal motion. So I'll turn it over to Garrett for the presentation. All right, I will now see if I can get the right window selected here. All right. So hopefully you see the uh, the full screen and not the presenter view. Correct. Okay, great. All right. So uh, this is the third stop and the, uh, the the presentation of the twenty three to twenty eight transportation and mobility department capital improvement program and. The, uh, the quick recap is at our first meeting, we provided an overview of the already approved 22 to 27 capital improvement program. And then at our meeting last month, we provided a draft overview uh, and proposal for consideration uh, and took uh, the feedback and comments of, uh, of TAB members at that meeting. And then this evening, we're here to request a formal recommendation to planning board of the CIP. So we'll go ahead and um, move forward. So uh, these are the aspects of the presentation. It will look very similar to the one from last time. Uh, and uh, the purpose of our capital improvement program, it differs from the annual budgets and on uh, the programmatic elements and uh, some of the divisions and that the capital improvement program allows us to make steps toward investing in the transportation system with one-time enhancement projects, as well as making investments in the existing infrastructure to take care of the, the major assets, such as our streets, our multi-use paths, our bridges, and our sidewalks. And uh, when we consider the uh, level of uh, and the, the quantity of assets that we have in the community, it's important we recognize the literally billions of dollars that we have all over our community that we need to take care of. Um, much like an individual uh, uh, homeowner or uh, a, a car owner or a bike owner, uh, that uh, you have to perform uh, maintenance and sometimes enhancements to those items, our, our transportation assets are no different. And so we make investments in those policies consistent with the recommendations from the 2019 TMP, which are summarized here on this slide. So the current uh, recommended CIP for 23 to 28 includes $88 million in total investment with approximately 9.7 million in grant funding with an average total of 13 million per year. And our major capital maintenance and multimodal programs comprising about $8 million of that per year. The funding largely comes from our sales tax and through grant funds. We have three different funding sources. We have the transportation fund, the transportation development fund, and the Boulder Junction fund. And we don't have any current projects in um, this CIP that are recommended from the Boulder Junction fund. That is because uh, most of the, well, all of the key public improvements identified for the Boulder Junction phase one have been now implemented. And so we are going to be focused on this um, uh, effort for the CIP from the transportation fund and the development fund. And the development fund is uh, funded by excise taxes that uh, supports the, um, the impacts from growth and development and being able to make investments in the system to, to accommodate those impacts. 
So uh, as we've noted a number of times in the, the last couple of months in our presentations, the city has a long history of turning our dimes and quarters into dollars through grant opportunities. The largest program that we typically are in pursuit of those dollars would be the transportation improvement or the TIP program through the Denver Regional Council of Governments or Dr. Cog. And then we also have other funding sources such as HSIP and TAP and SRTS, which uh, we discussed last month that uh, we routinely pursue. And uh, we noted uh, last time the projects that we have submitted applications for in the TIP. And we expect here by the end of the month, early August, to get some initial indication of how our, our most recent applications are faring. There are also a, a variety of new federal um, notice of funding opportunities that are out and available to local agencies to pursue. And we are working individually as a, a city, as well as collectively with our local agency partners, partners in the, the Boulder County region, as well as, as the greater Denver, Dr. Cog region to explore funding opportunities uh, for improvement programs and projects that uh, might uh, see benefit from these additional funding sources. One of the, uh, the major factors that is uh, challenging the ability of the transportation and mobility CIP to deliver further on the goals of the 2019 TFP is inflation. Um, you can't escape the news of inflation. It's pretty much everywhere you go right now. And uh, the construction marketplace is no different. And I think I mentioned last month that um, we saw 15% year over year asphalt price increases. I have another anecdotal piece of evidence to pass along that uh, for the first time ever, one of our on-call contractors requested a mid-year price increase to account for the uh, increasing cost of uh, fuel and particularly um, diesel um, to be able to transport materials and equipment to and from the community. Um, they had requested uh, some uh, additional pricing increases to, to reflect that. So uh, it continues to be a challenge that uh, our purchasing power is going down a little bit each year. And this is a, a slide that we shared last month that uh, speaks to the uh, particular challenges that are unique to the infrastructure marketplace. This uh, information coming from the CDOT cost data book and indicating the uh, double digit growth over the last couple of years. So as noted, the CIP provides funding for both individual one-time projects as well as for programs, the majority of this funding going toward our programs. And the, uh, the mix of that is approximately 60% to programs and 40% to projects. So this is a, a recap of the tabular summary of each of the individual line items within the CIP programs. The, uh, the, the top seven or eight are primarily focused on capital maintenance. And then the bottom five or six are focused on multimodal enhancements to, uh, to uh, making safe and uh, improvements to the safety and mobility of our multimodal system. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well as recap some of the information, information from last month. Um, oh, I, want, I did want to note, uh, as shown here in yellow, um, and this was noted in the memo, changes from last year's C, uh, CIP uh, to this uh, year's CIP as the consolidation of individual line items focused on local streets uh, to rec in recognition of investments now being prioritized on our core arterial network or CAN. And so each of the rows highlighted in yellow here show the, the changes from the, the CIP as presented last year. And then on the individual projects, the only new project proposed for this year is the traffic signal at 14th and Canyon to support a better crossing and better operation of the downtown Boulder station, which we will actually talk about uh, as the next agenda item this evening. Uh, then the summary of projects in the development uh, fund are, are largely focused on the implementation of uh, a single project, the 28th and Colorado intersection, signal maintenance upgrades, and providing funding for development coordination, as well as grant pursuits uh, under the uh, TIP local match and TMP implementation. So just taking a, a further look at some of the programs, uh, I don't want to get too far into this since we've kind of covered it um, last couple months. Um, but uh, a reminder that the largest source of our capital maintenance programs goes towards our 
pavement management program. And we're uh, uh, pleased to note that uh, this has expanded in its scope and its impact as it's uh, being leveraged to make safety and mobility enhancements um, for Vision Zero, as well as the low stress walk and bike network on corridors uh, such as Lehigh that we visited on our bike tour a few weeks ago. We also have the pedestrian programs that are focused on proactive repair of sidewalks. Just as a brief reminder, the Boulder Revised Code, our city code, says that the responsibility of maintenance and long-term repair of sidewalks adjacent to properties are the responsibility of that landowner. But because the uh, uh, walking is the fundamental mode of transportation in the city, we, um, we look for opportunities to identify funding to make repairs to the, the, to the, the sidewalk network, uh, make it more usable. And um, we work with adjacent property owners and have a sidewalk repair program, which is the middle row here, uh, identified as repair replacement in ADA. And then we also have a, a reactive program where if an individual landowner would like to make repairs to the sidewalk, we will repair or that, uh, make that repair with them in a 50-50 partnership. And that makes us unique and, uh, uh, and rare. And as most of the cities in the state do not work with landowners to provide uh, supplemental public funding in this manner. And then finally, we have the missing links program that uh, installs missing sidewalk links as well as uh, installs pedestrian crossing treatments, uh, which are the type of projects you see in the images here on the lower right. We also have the multi-use path programs, one focused on enhancements, which has largely been focused in the confluence path area, as well as the multi-use capital path maintenance, uh, which is, uh, we've got some illustrations of that in the lower right here, uh, out by the community gardens where we repaid those pathways a couple of years ago. And so that goes towards paving and replacing of bridge decks along the multi-use path network. And then finally, we have our uh, bridge asset management program to help take care of the multitude of minors and major structures that are multi-use paths and bikeways and roadways uh, cross because we have uh, 17 um, uh, drainage tributaries as well as uh, 13 irrigation ditches. We have uh, several of these types of crossings and several hundred structures to, um, to take care of. We need this important uh, funding to be able to take care of these structures. So uh, changes as noted to the, uh, to the CIP include repurposing of the individual local street line items and to the core arterial network line item, and as well, the 14th and Canyon traffic signal replacement, which will happen a couple of years after the conclusion of the downtown Boulder gate expansion. So the, uh, other major line item of the, the, the CIP is our TIP local match and TMP implementation. And this is programmed at about an average of 3 million per year. And we use this funding source to help provide the bulk of the local match on each of our grant projects. So as we find out which of our projects are awarded funding through the TIP cycle we're currently going through, as well as the one we'll be starting later this year and into 2023, we will repurpose the funds from this TIP local match TMP implementation to uh, provide the local match for standalone projects, which will appear in the CIP we present to you next uh, spring and early summer. Individual projects that we noted last time that uh, the CIP is, is making possible include the 28th and Colorado protected intersection, which is an outcome of the 30th and Colorado corridor study. And we just had a, a preliminary design review meeting with our partners uh, throughout the city, as well as uh, our partners at CDOT this, just this past week. So uh, we're pleased with the progress on this and it is, continues to be on track for 2023 construction. And this will, of course, build out the protected bike lane infrastructure, as well as convert general purpose lanes to bat lanes in the east-west direction along Colorado Avenue. Then we also have the 30th Street Multimodal Enhancements, and that project is uh, past the preliminary design and moving toward final design. And we'll also make multimodal enhancements between Colorado and just south of Arapahoe. And that one is also on track for uh, going to construction in 2023. The uh, Regional Transportation and Technology uh, Grant is going to be funding 
the, uh, the Vision uh, Zero as well as Smart City Investments. And uh, we just purchased a lot of the equipment um, to bring that to fruition. And so we'll be connecting a number of our traffic signals to the broadband network, which has been installed by our partners and in the information, information technology department over the last couple of years so that we can provide uh, more real-time dynamic response to traffic operations. And then we also have the Safer Signals project that uh, will be replacing signal heads to provide for safety features such as leading pedestrian intervals at a, a number of uh, locations around the city. We also have the HSIP or Highway Safety Improvement Program funding for traffic signals at Folsom Pine, Broadway Baseline, and, Bro uh, and Baseline and Mohawk that will uh, be going to construction in 2023. And uh, we also have the East Arapaho Multi-Use Path Project that uh, is, uh, went through a SEEP and was approved by TAB here pretty uh, recently and will be going to construction in 2023. And I believe that we'll be having an update here this evening um, to talk about it as uh, Alex mentioned earlier. Uh, we'll, uh, we've got Nathan here to provide an update on the status of this project. I'll also be uh, talking about the downtown Boulder station here in just a moment. And also as noted, the 14th and Canyon traffic signal is needed to accommodate better bus turning operation as well as safety and mobility enhancements for all users at the intersection. And that is slated for construction in 2025. So those are some of the highlights of the key projects and programs that uh, we are requesting that you recommend to planning board. So the next step is that we would go to planning board in August, and then we'll be visiting city council in September and October as part of the overall budget and CIP approval. And so our request to you is uh, the recommendation as noted. And with that, I'm uh, concluding the presentation and happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Garrett. Any questions from TAB? I have one, one kind of general mm -hmm. question. Um, yeah, thank you for this um, and, and for all the opportunities to um, and really learn this process. Um, my question is, I know that you know, the inflation is factored in to the numbers and costs increasing over time. I'm curious how, um, uh, how like new new assets, so a new, whether it's a new road or a new um, path or sidewalks, like how are all of those factored in? Is there kind of an, is there an interplay between the, the costs of maintaining those new facilities and the plans that call for those new facilities? Because um, I'm just wondering kind of how that, maybe it's through this process, maybe it's through some other process. I'm just, I'm curious, um, how yeah those those plans and these budgets are sort of aligned over time that's a great question and so every time we identify a project to be a part of the cip we are, are required by our uh, budget and finance department to answer the question is this going to increase or decrease needs for maintenance of, uh, of a particular facility and occasionally we do wind up in a place where we are going to have increased maintenance needs but that's uh, also a question of trade-offs. So uh, if we are going to have additional maintenance needs for perhaps a protected bike lane facility, but it's going to make for safer transportation choices for folks, that's the type of trade-off that uh, we certainly are open to considering. Um, we strive to, to implement capital projects that are actually going to reduce maintenance over time. And an example of that is the currently under construction North Broadway Recon, uh, reconstruction project where we're paving that section of street from asphalt uh, and concrete where asphalt has a typical service life of about seven to eight years before it needs maintenance and attention uh, and concrete you could uh, let concrete go for about 20 or 30 years before it needs maintenance and attention so our maintenance crews are now going to spend a lot less time filling potholes on North Broadway because we're repaving it in concrete so that's an example of, of how uh, we explore lots of, of uh, avenues and opportunities to try to reduce the ongoing maintenance with projects where possible. Great, thank you, appreciate it. Right. 
Garrett, also a question about um, inflation, um, and I'm just, I'm just thinking about how to put this into context. So maybe I'll, I'll try two kind of specific questions. One, um, how, how significant is, the, is the, uh, the added cost that we're experiencing due to inflation? How, how significant is that within overall budget, like just sort of order of magnitude? And also, do you have any sense that, um, that the transportation department is experiencing inflation more so than other departments, um, or is it just sort of across the board? Or do you not know? I'm just sort of curious for an overall, you know, to understand this in context. Well, I, so I can say that uh, we recently went through a round of budget reviews across the department, and I uh, had the, the pleasure to, to hear presentations from almost every department where inflation was certainly a factor. Uh, as to uh, the, whether there was an apples to apples comparison about who was experiencing it the most, uh, Ryan, I'm, I'm I don't think that uh, there was that kind of information presented, um, but uh, I, so where the inflation is really um, hitting our department hardest is more on the capital maintenance programs and the operational budgets, because when we build our capital projects, uh, build those budgets rather, we, we try to build in a pretty healthy inflation and contingency factor to help address uh, the likelihood of increased costs as that project um, moves forward. The, uh, the annual programs though, uh, we uh, assume a, a baseline sort of inflation um, typically in the two to 3% range. And if we're dealing with 10 to 15, what that means is we're having to scale back on, on the number of streets that we might be able to chip seal or the number of uh, sidewalk ramps that we can replace and, and upgrade. We haven't quantified um, just how uh, much it's affected us this year relative to last year, but uh, that's something I can certainly look into and follow up to, to get you some specific information. Yeah, and I was just gonna add to Garrett's point that um, certainly, I think across the organization, um, those that have kind of capital maintenance projects, um, they are experiencing the impact of inflation. And, and then certainly within the transportation sector, you know, across the state, um, in fact, our numbers are from kind of CDOT construction cost index. And so um, we're not alone, right? It's kind of every sector of transportation when, within the state and probably nationally as well. I was wondering with the downtown Boulder Station, we you identified the need to upgrade the signal at 14th and Canyon. And as it's shown in here, it's all with local funds. Would there be anything prohibiting us in the coming year or so to try to get a grant, like a HSIP grant, to to try to make the local costs to that less? We're certainly open to that. Um, and if there is an opportunity, we'll absolutely pursue it. Um, typically, in order to be successful at uh, receiving HSIP funds, you have to demonstrate a crash pattern or a crash history. And we don't really have a strong crash pattern at this particular intersection. We're more looking to be proactive in terms of expecting in, uh, significantly increased pedestrian activity crossing the location here, as well as um, making sure that we've got uh, the equipment and the controller, as well as the signal heads to be able to accommodate the, the bus turning movements as safely as possible. Um, and so it's, it's more of a proactive rather than a reactive. If we can persuade our partners at CDOT that that's a good use of their funds, absolutely, we'll uh, explore that. Yeah, thanks. And then, Last month, we got an update on the 28th in Colorado design project. Uh, and I remember on the, the Northwest corner there, the pork chop island was slated to be removed. And then in your slide tonight, it showed a, a right turn bypass lane. Has something changed there or is that just an old old um, graphic? I, I might have grabbed an old graphic. So uh, please uh, go with uh, the, the information from last time and not mine which might be, uh, I might have grabbed from the wrong file. Okay, no worries, thanks. Any more questions from Tab? Not seeing any, we'll open this up to a public hearing. Any members of the public that wish to provide some testimony on the CIP can go ahead and raise your hand now using the reaction tool.
and I'm not seeing any hands come up. So I'll open it up to tab for deliberation. And I'll start by saying I would happily approve this as is. I don't have anything to add, Alex, and I uh, I trust your uh, <laughs> your direction on that. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, I feel like we've we've had a, a good chance to discuss and influence this over not just the last three months, but over a year. So please with where it is. So I'll in a, entertain a motion to uh, entertain any motions. If not, I will move that tab recommends the staff recommended 2023 to 2028 CIP to planning board. I second. Thanks. Any additional deliberation? If not, all those in favor? Passes unanimously. Thanks, Garrett. Next up, we have our second public hearing of the night, which will be about the downtown Boulder Station community environmental assessment process. I think Garrett's got this one as well. I do. So I uh, just want to say thank you for your participation in the CIP and looking forward to uh, working with you all on the implementation of it in future years. And uh, so we are here to uh, this evening ask for your recommendation of the community environmental assessment process approval of the downtown boulder gate expansion project and um, so we presented this uh last time or last at the last meeting and so this is here uh, we're here this evening to have the public hearing and ask for your formal recommendation so uh just a quick overview on the project so a reminder that the uh, uh the past studies whoops i need to advance um, past studies have shown that the downtown Boulder Station accommodates more buses and passengers than it was uh, uh, sized to deliver, and uh, it's going to expect it to increase as we uh, are slowly making our way toward the implementation of BRT uh, along Highway 119 and Highway 7. And the gate expansion project will help to provide additional capacity for transit operations and making better connections for people accessing the station by foot, bicycle, and or personal vehicle. As well as, uh, and I just wanna note, uh, meeting the uh, um, Americans with Disabilities Act guidelines. So here are some images that uh, depict the con existing conditions at the station, which serves uh, about the same number of lines as Denver's Union Station with half the gate capacity. And so uh, the, Section uh, adjacent to the building station, 14th Street north of Canyon, was successfully converted back in 2014 and 2015, and that was converted to a full transit street. And we are looking to um, do something somewhat similar with the 14th Street section south of Canyon. It wouldn't be a transit only street, but providing gates of a similar type and configuration to what you see north of Canyon. So the project scope would provide five additional gates, which includes two sawtooth, sawtooth gates on the west side and one sawtooth gate on the east side, as well as two parallel gates on the east side, wider sidewalks, urban design and landscaping amenities, information kiosks, as well as wayfinding. Here is a uh, sort of a bird's eye view to uh, get a better perspective of the existing downtown Boulder Station, as well as the 14th Street expansion and how it intersects with Arapahoe and with Canyon. So this slide depicts the uh, a, a zoomed in uh, a, a exhibit of the, uh, the configuration of the gate expansion and shows the, the gates as well as potential shelter locations and kiosks, as well as a relocated driveway adjacent to what we call the, the James Travel Building, uh, uh, on just north of the pedestrian crossing on the east side, as well as uh, landscaping enhancements and uh, 
providing uh, some operational changes to the intersection at Arapaho and 14th to accommodate bus turning movements. So we've uh, participated in community engagement on this project through a variety of sources, including um, site visits with the Center for People with Disabilities, station pop-ups with uh, community connectors, rack card flyers, the web page, neighborhood mailers, and city social media. And we, through that process, have received a really uh, good set of uh, feedback um, for consideration and how to make the project better. And uh, some examples of that are on the next slide here. We've heard concerns about um, security and what that would look like. And so we have held meetings with um, RTD security as well as the Boulder police to, uh, to note that, uh, that there's a partnership in place which would be uh, extended to these additional gates on the 14th Street South. And that RTD is evaluating the possibility of how they might add additional security. And the commitment that we are making to RTD is that through our project, we will look to provide a conduit for fiber and power supply so that we can connect to the existing security technology that, that they have inside the building of the, the station to provide uh, close uh, circuit television cameras for security for the, the personnel who are monitoring that uh, uh, 24-7, uh, both at the station as well as its at locations remote. So that is uh, an addition to the project. And as a part of the the SEEP, uh, through coordination with other departments and in, input here at the city, we have uh, uh, recognized that this project is located in the floodplain and identified uh, a design which will cause no rise to the floodplain, which is uh, good for all of the, the, the business and landowners along this corridor. And we have also identified a plan that uh, will work in coordination with our partners in the forestry and parks and recreation department that will uh, look to preserve a couple of high value oak and honey locust trees and some of the other lower value trees that would be removed would be mitigated with tree plantings as part of the project. So a reminder, the funding for this project comes from a, a grant through Dr. Cog, as well as a grant from RTD, and about 40% of the funds are coming from the city for approximately a $1 million project. So we have uh, been engaged with uh, community engagement and the concept development through the spring, and we are here with you at the public hearing this evening, and this is slated for city council call-up um, agenda on July 21st. Uh, we got uh, word that uh, city council would like a presentation on this next uh, at their meeting on, on July 21st. And so we're looking forward to the engagement with city council and um, uh, upon the approval of the seat, then we'll move forward with permitting and final design and uh, construction document development so that we can move forward to construction in 2023. So those are all of the, uh, the sort of the, the, the items that uh, are part of the SEEP and uh, the key elements of this project. And so what we'd like to ask from you now is a recommendation and uh, approval of the SEEP uh, to city council. Thanks, Garrett. Before we get to the public hearing, does anyone have any clarifying questions? Um, I have a question, um, which is, I, I don't know a lot about <laughs> transit street design. Um, so I'm curious in terms of shelter placement, like how that is decided. Is it based on where there's space or is it based on like some proximity to the, where the buses arrive or sort of the thought process there? So this location uh, is going to be a bit unique in that we're going to have to work with a number of existing constraints. If we were starting from scratch, we'd probably like to have a shelter adjacent to every one of the gates. But due to the number of driveways and building entrances and landscaping and utility conflicts, we're going to fit them in where, uh, um, where we possibly can uh, and try to situate them as close to the, to the gates as possible. Okay, thank you. Any more questions for Garrett? 
not seen any, we'll open it up for the public hearing. Any members of the public that wish to speak on this matter will have up to three minutes to do so. Veronica, I see Nick has his hand raised. If you're interested in speaking, please use the reaction tool uh, to raise your hand. All right, Nick, I'm gonna ask you to unmute and I'll start the three minutes now. Hey, I just had a quick question here. You mentioned like fiber and I don't remember what else, but is there any plan to have like, like quite a bit of power running in in case you guys switch to electric buses? Oh, maybe this isn't like a forward and backward, but anyway, maybe, maybe um, consider electric buses like converting from natural gas, whatever you guys have currently. That's all I had. Yes, I appreciate the question. I don't think that we would be looking to accommodate the, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, charging of the buses at this particular um, facility along 14th Street. And I am probably not the best person to speak to how RTD um, uh, charges the electric buses. I think that's probably at their, um, their, at their maintenance facility over on 33rd Street. But uh, I think uh, Natalie and or Danny are, are here in the meeting and, and would be able to speak to that. Danny, are you available? I mean, I can certainly um, speak to it, but I, it would be great. Danny probably has more relevant information than I do. Yeah, happy to. So good evening, Danny O'Connor, City of Boulder, Principal Transportation Planner, Transit Program Manager. Um, yeah, so as far as, um, you know, the, the fleets, the fleets in the region, RTD, as well as uh, the city's hop fleets, we're, we're all looking and, and taking steps for electrification. And, um, you know, right now, really, the, the electrification um, uh, decisions and infrastructure is typically being built at garage locations where vehicles are maintained and housed overnight. So in in um, in Boulder for the RTD um, buses that serve downtown Boulder Station, that facility is as Garrett mentions is over on Thirty Third Street, um, and RTD is part of its um, it's part of the Colorado One Nineteen. Um, study for, for BRT has, is also envisioning a larger um, maintenance facility in Boulder County uh, really to, to be prepped and, and ready to go for electric buses as they move into that, into that space. That is part of their um, kind of long range plan where they are on that is, you know, probably a few years out. Um, the city, just this context is, uh, you, know, you know, we, we partner with VIA Mobility Services for the HOP service. Uh, currently, there's three electric buses that are in service and that go by uh, downtown Boulder Station. Um, all of their charging right now is occurring at its facility, at the VIA facility here, here in Boulder off of 63rd Street. Um, and that's typically where it's working, just so that it can be charged overnight um, and that the buses can run full during the day um, when they're out and about. Thanks, Danny. And Nick, for that question. Any other members of the public wishing to speak during this public hearing? Not seeing any. I'll open it up for a tab discussion. Yes, I'm. Oh, Ryan. Alex, do you want to go? Um, Okay, uh, so I was one of four of the TAB members that attended the um, the field trip to visit the site, and um, I, you know, I there was a few members of the community that that were pretty knowledgeable there, and between us and TAB, um, it didn't seem to me like there was anything, I don't know, controversial or any big questions. So this seems pretty um, pretty straightforward. At least that was my impression. So I don't have any questions, although I think Nick raises a <laughs> excuse me an interesting point to me that it's sort of a broader point about what's the what's our what's our plan for electric buses in boulder and this is like a pretty big question and i know cdot is involved in addition to rtd so um i'd love to talk more about that in the future um but i think that's probably a separate 
kind of a separate topic for, for from this one. So no, I think this is um I don't have any questions about this and I'm, I'm happy to happy to support it unless any other tab members have um any concerns I have that I don't know about. Thanks, Ryan. I'm also ready to support it. I hope that we can have a conversation with CDOT and RTD about the 14th and Canyon signal, see if they can be supportive in that. And then I know this is just for the infrastructure and some of the operations decision is gonna happen later, like which routes stop at which gate. Um, whenever that conversation does happen, I hope that equity is a big part of that decision-making process. Some of the routes that serve Boulder, downtown Boulder Station are more white color commute hour oriented and others are have a larger span of service throughout the day and are more of a, a local route. Um, and so I think not just looking at wh which buses have the highest ridership, but um, who's riding the buses and, and what time of day will help um, hopefully address some of those security and safety concerns. Not seeing any more hands. Garrett, do you have any proposed language for us? I think that it was in the, the memo, uh, but I don't have it in the on a PowerPoint slide. Uh, I think it could be as simple as um, that uh, you recommend the approval of the downtown Boulder Station gate expansion seep to uh, to city council. Okay, Meredith, do you have something? That's exactly what the memo says. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. Or I'll bring one forward myself. Uh, I move that TAB recommends to the City Council uh, approval of the downtown Boulder Station expansion SEEP. I second it. Thanks, Trini. Any deliberation? Seeing none, all those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. With that, we'll move forward a little ahead of schedule for agenda item six, which is a staff briefing and tab feedback regarding the 3825 Walnut Street concept plan review. Natalie, is this you? Thanks, thanks, Alex. And actually, I'm going to introduce um, the Danica Powell. She'll be presenting this. And and Shabnam, please feel free to do the introduction as well. Um, I think we just kind of put a, us both on this so that somebody would have a chance to introduce the consultant who I know is representing the developer tonight. Are you able to hear me? We are. Great. Um, good evening. My name is Shabnam Bista, and I'm a senior planner at the Development Review Department. Um, so today we have the concept plan for a life sciences building. Um, it's approximately 112,000 square feet with 226 surface parking provided. Um, a public hearing was held at uh, planning board on April 28th, and then the item was presented as a call up to city council on uh, May 17th. Um, and the key issue that um, was discussed at city council and um, referred to then tab was regarding the transit village area plan connections. The property itself, which is um, 3825 Walnut isn't in the plan, but it's impacted by the, the connections plan that's within TVAP. Um, and the applicant has prepared a brief presentation today to um, talk about that item and their efforts to date to address the issue and get feedback from TAB. Great. Hi, I'm Danica Powell with Trestle Strategy Group. Thank you, Shabnam. I'm joined here by Daniel Eisenman with Conscious Bay Company, who is the property owner, and Shannon Jones of Stantec. They are the architect and designer, and Tony Thornton, also architect and designer with Stantec. So I know we only have a brief amount of time. Maybe we might have a little more because we're early on the agenda, but I have a quick presentation. I will 
acknowledge that in my many years of working on projects in Boulder and being on planning board, I have never um, been referred to TAB from city council. So this is my first. So we are looking forward to your feedback. I think it's a great feedback loop that was just incorporated. So we've done our best to explain um, what we're working on and trying to figure out and got feedback on at both planning board and council and would love your feedback as we more move forward through the process. We have um, just gone through concept reviews, so your feedback is very important as we continue to refine the site design. We have not submitted site review yet, so this is really integral to the site planning for the project site. So it's a very important meeting for us, and so thank you for having us. And I will share um, some of the background information, and our whole team is available for questions and discussion. So this project is on the 3800 block of Walnut, um, which is currently occupied by the um, restaurant supply company. And we are looking at redeveloping the site into a life science building. It's an old building that needs upgrading. And so we're, we took the concept planned to planning board and city council. And as part of that, there's several connections that cross this property. The one that we're here to discuss tonight is the TVAP local connector road that was identified in 2007. So I'm gonna lead you through our analysis and um, feel free to interrupt me with questions if you have them. And I see this as a discussion, um, not just a presentation. So in 2007, many of you were probably involved in the TVAP planning process. There were a lot of connections identified at that time, some of many of which have been built and some of which will be built during TVAP phase two. Um, this property is not in TVAP phase two, but it is adjacent to phase two. So there was a collector road identified collecting, uh, connecting Walnut to Frontier underneath the railroad tracks. And it was an item noted under, there was, it was number 62 local connection. You can see in the bottom left saying, let's support, let's create a underpass at the railroad tracks to improve access to this area and support increase in land use intensity. At the time that property owner suggested that they would pay for it. And I think it was added as a, a connection into the TVAP plan. I will note that the current property owner, Conscious Bay Company, is not the same owner that was there in 2007. So from our research, which we've done a lot, um, but haven't fully uncovered everything, it doesn't appear there was a feasibility study for that connection at the time for a local connector road. So we are proposing to remove that or we, during this um, development process, we are proposing to remove that connection from the plan. And I will talk about what connections we are providing, but I also know that we quickly dip into site review criteria. So I'm, I'm gonna focus on the TVAP connection and I'm happy to answer any other questions as they come up. So when we looked at the feasibility, we looked at not only the underpass, which was um, identified in the TVAP, we actually looked at an overpass and an at-grade crossing, as well as a multimodal crossing. We heard um, feedback from community cycles that there would be interest in a multimodal connection across the tracks. So that did enter our discussion and our um, evaluation. So during that time, we've discussed this with BNSF. We actually have a good relationship with them in having meetings and discussing um, you know, this project with them. We're working on a few other projects with them as well to improve the flood protection in the area. JVA, our civil engineer, looked at the feasibility of an overpass and an underpass. And we reached out to the prior property owner, as was suggested during our public hearings, to find out what they were thinking and what their thought process was on, you know, creating a local road connection underneath the railroad tracks. We also did some cost estimating with our civil engineer. So from an underpass standpoint, which is what was identified in TVAP, um, we found it technically infeasible. It would be financially expensive as well. It would 
Um, it's located within the 100 year floodplain and the ramping would extend beyond the sidewalk edges of Walnut into the right of way and also into the vehicular right of way. So while BNSF would entertain a connection under their railroad tracks, it, it would also just be a big deep hole for a road connecting through these properties. We also don't own all sides of the equation. So that would be a difficult um, road to build with this project. So we looked at an overpass. What would that look like? Could we go over the railroad tracks? Um, also technically infeasible for the same reasons. It has a lot of ramping. It requires a very large um, ramp up and down. It's also located within the 100 year floodplain. It would extend farther beyond the underpass and it would look a lot like the Foothills Parkway overpass, which is a very large kind of um, ramp up with a lot of embankments and a lot of just physical separations, which we don't think would be good for the community development in this area. So it would have this really giant ramp up and over the railroad tracks. It would create, it would bifurcate the site, it would create view shed problems. Um, it would also impact connectivity and accessibility. We also found from our engineer that it would request, we would need variances from the design and construction standards if we needed to achieve the vertical ramping necessary to you know, get down on both sides. Um, it would have probably accessibility issues and it would require additional property beyond what Conscious Bay owns. So then we looked at, well, we can't go under, we can't go over, so let's look at grade. And as many of you probably know from your interactions with BNSF, they don't, they will not allow any more at grade road or trail connections. Um, I can get into the differentiations between the road and trail, but if we were to do an at grade crossing, it would require closure of another at grade crossing in Boulder. And according to staff, who hopefully can talk about this in more detail, Closing any other at grade crossings would uh, cause significant distress to the system because we've worked really hard to have safe railroad crossings. And so that was like a real no go with the railroad. Um, I've exerted some of their policy statements. I also have some about the trails. They their policy says will allow trails across the railroad tracks if they are with a road. So, and the road requires a great, an at grade crossing of another location. Again, I'm not the expert on this, but I'm happy to discuss this further with staff and yourselves. So the other connection that is identified, this is actually in the TMP connections plan, which is a, a more recent document shows a trail multimodal connection along the south side of the railroad tracks. So this actually connects all the way um, from the TVAP all the way out to East Boulder. And we looked and it was shown in the East Boulder sub-community plan. So this appears to be a very strong multimodal connection for which this project could provide for um, and provide the trail connection. BNSF has said it cannot be in their right of way and that it has to be fenced. Anything has to be fenced from their railroad. So this would be a, a 10 foot multimodal connection with the appropriate easements and um, that would be located. We would um, put that on our property here and ultimately over time, hopefully it would connect to the rest of the system. Again, this is our property. And when I was talking about the local um, road connection, it would be approximately right here. As many of you know, a lot of these lines were drawn with kind of thick markers. So it's, it, it and they were, the this connection was actually shown on, we believe BNSF property, but we would move that off of their property onto ours. And this connection was shown straddling, we believe the two properties. So this is the existing site. There's the one story warehouse building. So here to get into what our proposed project is, is this is the multimodal reservation for that multimodal path that was in the TMP. And that would be out of the railroad right of way with a fence. And here we are looking at a potential pedestrian path 
that would connect to this multimodal reservation and another pedestrian path around the site to provide really good site circulation, which is a, a, an important component of the site review criteria, um, but not proposing to create a multimodal connection across the railroad tracks, because we don't believe that's anything that would be supported by the railroad in the future. Um, these are the site connections um, that we just discussed. And you ha have our submitted materials. Here's our cover letter where we described our analysis and what we went through. Um, so project site, and then you can see, you know, TVAP up here uh, as well, and a lot of the other multimodal connections. Here's the TMP connection. TVAP, here's our number note 62. So these are just, these are all the materials we've provided in advance of the meeting. And here's our site diagram showing the circulation, which I can bring up in more detail if you're interested showing um, circulation around the site. And then we had some background materials from BNSF discussing the different options in the position papers. We did include the email to the prior um, previous property owner and didn't get a response um, more than doubtful we ever engaged since our program was never to redevelop. Uh, so that was from the owner at the time of TVAP. And then here's more of the technical documents. So I'm gonna stop sh sharing there and open it up for discussion and questions. Thanks, Danica. Anyone from TAB have some questions or feedback? Alex, um, so, thanks. Danica, thank you. Um, just could you help to just sort of crystallize, um, I guess, the decision that is being proposed to be made and the alternative, like in the sense that maybe the alternative is to do nothing. And if nothing, then what is, what does that mean? Just, just that sense of kind of, very simply, what's what are the are there options on the table that we should be thinking about, or um, how, how to think about what is, what is the decision versus the alternative? Yeah, and this is the gray area I don't totally understand, so I'll look to staff for support. But I think the question for you is: Would you support removing the the collector road underpass from the transit village area plan? Is that a road connection that you would like to see. That opens up, as we've shown, a, a bunch of other discussion items. So, I, but I think that was the sp specific ask of TAB. But of course, we want to discuss and we want to support good multimodal connectivity through our project in the area. So, I, I don't know if staff has more input on what the specific ask of TAB is, but that's what I understand. So I'll address that a little bit further if you don't mind. Edward Stafford, Senior Manager of Engineering, Planning and Development Services. So Danica, uh, summary is pretty accurate there. They're making a request for a modification to the connections plan that are part of TVAP and that is to modify or really to remove that connection of that collector road and the crossing or underpass of the railroad. Alternatives to that, uh, of course, you could recommend that it remain and that they accommodate that within their site and provide funding towards its construction, which we would then have to uh, evaluate as a part of the site review and determine what the impacts would be and what uh, the implications for both the city and the applicant, certainly an option. Um, the opposite end of that spectrum is to completely remove any connection, bike, ped, or railroad, or uh, street, sorry, through there. Um, and remove that from the plan, and then their development would be evaluated based upon the site review criteria for general circulation. In the middle could be whether or not there's uh, to something to remain from a multi-use path or pedestrian path connection through there, which could or could not include a crossing of the railroad, acknowledging that the information that's been provided through their analysis is that a crossing in the railroad is likely technically infeasible and again would be a challenge in there, but you could potentially have the, the path go up to their property line and connect into the area that they're looking at a reservation. We do believe that the railroad may have a little bit of concern there about making sure we don't dead end people into the railroad right of way. So that's something we would work with the applicant through their site review to address. 
And um, Charles Farrow, Planning and Development Services. Edward, do you want to talk a little bit just about staff's initial recommendation when we went forward to planning board? Certainly. Um, and, and we have looked at this and recognizing that some of the more technical analysis didn't happen in the plan. Staff has been supportive of the applicant's request to delete this particular connection. Thanks, Edward. Anyone from TAB have any opinions on this? I have a clarifying and a clarifying question. Um, so I understand that the it, it's not it's not possible. It sounds like to do just a, a um, bike multi-use path without the road. The railroad won't permit that. Is that correct, Danica? That's what they said. Okay. Um, That's our understanding of reading their requirements. So, um, and I, uh, Rafer might be here from BNSF. I saw him maybe come in. So he's the expert on their policies. So. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, sure, I guess if, um, sorry, I missed the name, but if someone from BNSF could speak to that, that'd be really helpful. Just to confirm if that's the case. Yeah, I think it's Rafer. There he is. Sure. Yeah. Rafer being a staff here. Um, sorry, short notice. Garrett, uh, let me in here. Yeah, we we don't generally allow new at grade crossings. You know, our, our policy is to to reduce at grade crossings, to reduce obviously risks of train on train on ped or train on vehicle collisions. You know, every crossing is a, a chance for you know more more potential incidences, but, you know, if the city could identify alternate, you know, could identify connections that they would, would want to get rid of that would increase safety, it could, um, you know, it could be negotiated for, but, you know, without, without alternates that would close and generally net increase safety, it wouldn't, wouldn't be allowed. Thanks. And then, so that's for the at grade. And then if it were um, an underpass or overpass, would it have the same, all the same technical challenges that an entire road um, construction here would connection versus a multi-use path connection? Uh, I don't know if it's I mean, for Danica or- We build or overpasses <laughs> time. It's, it's, a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a cost sure. play. Yeah, again, not being an engineer, but um, the overpass would require the same ramping up and down because you have to have the clearance for the railroad tracks and other clearances. The underpass possibly would be less deep um, because you wouldn't be driving fire trucks under it. I don't know. Daniel, do you have a more technical answer? Uh, short answer is... Uh... To, to do an overpass or an underpass, it would be upwards of $10 million uh, to execute, which is uh, just an extraordinary amount of money to, for a private uh, developer to, to execute such a large uh, uh, public improvement uh, project. Second, if you can imagine an overpass being as tall as Foothills Parkway when it crosses the railway, imagine the division that would create on both sides. Uh, it's just very unpleasant. Uh, and then Third, uh, the underpass in order the ramping and Sharon Procopio is uh, for here from JBA, in order to make the ramping work, uh, we would have to, uh, it seems like extend beyond the curb line on Walnut Avenue. So I'm not sure how that happens. Uh, so it seems like a lot of things are working against us uh, to make this happen. And uh, so generally that's, uh, that's where our position lies. Yeah, thank you. And and that and that's the same regardless of whether it were an underpass that was a multi-use path or or an entire road. Is that okay? That's what's trying. And Sharon, did you want to add anything? We do have our civil engineer here who's the expert on the Hi Becky. Design. Um yeah, I can answer it more from a technical standpoint, but Daniel's correct. The the issue isn't the height of or the width of the overpass it's the requirement that bnsf has going over their train track so the cost and the height is really based on that um, if you add a road obviously you're adding more decking but you're still requiring the same amount of length 
to make it accessible and we can't put um, non-accessible paths in the city of Boulder. So effectively we're building the same thing. It's just narrower, but the height, the length, all the things that tell us where we actually have to end it on both sides of the property, that's what actually doesn't change between the two to answer your question. And Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's and I would also like to remind everybody that there's an at grade connection already within 400 feet of our site on Pearl in, uh, in the rail, on Pearl Street in the rail. So we're not that far from that existing connection uh, already that's a safe connection. Uh, okay. So just wanted to remind everybody that. I have a, another question that this isn't for staff is, um, are given the, the other plans from paths in this area, are there, looking back at this plan now, are those, are those all still feasible? Was it just this piece that was not, or given this interaction with the railroad and are there other connections that are also unlikely or path, you know, um, paths that couldn't be developed as in the plan, looking back at it at this point? So we've not completed a, a review of the, the rest of the plan from a tactical feasibility standpoint in the recent time. So really can't answer that fully, other than to say that the one uh, that runs parallel to the railroad that Danica had in her presentation, that discussion um, that was shown as being within the railroad right of way, we're also concerned given the railroad stance on the use of the right of way, whether that one can be built in there. It's not that that can't be built at all, it's whether or not that location um, is, feasible or will we need to show it on the opposite side on the private properties and how we would acquire those rights to build it. Okay, thank you. I think I'd be okay with amending the connections plan to remove this particular connection number 62, just given the feasibility with the grade changes, the cost, the railroad, the floodplain, um, I think, having that potential north-south pet bike connection up to maybe a multi-use path along the railway would be a good thing to include. Um, and that overall this would would help provide access, pet bike access throughout the area and help get people to and from Boulder Junction, help serving as a, a first last mile connection. Uh, this stretch of Walnut, I think it has about a, a third of a mile gap in between dedicated pedestrian crossings. There's a pedestrian crossing at maybe 33rd Street and then another one over on the other side of Foothills over by KGNU. So if I think a, a good way to help support the goals of the TMP and improve the, the connectivity of this area would be to try to introduce a, a ped crossing in this area. So if there is a multi-use path on the the west side of the building, have that align with a crossing of Walnut Street would be nice. Um, and then another question I had, and Danica, would it be possible to pull up that circulation plan? Yes. So I think one best practice with connectivity is is trying to establish a much as much of a grid as possible. And so I was wondering if you guys had considered it looks like the site has a single driveway. I'm getting there, sorry. No worries. I think this was what you wanted to see. Yeah, or the, the schematic one that also showed um, 38th Street with the, the truck. Oh, okay. Sorry, this one? Yeah, thank okay. you. So I was wondering if you had considered locating the, the lone driveway off of Walnut Street at 38th Street, which was at the, the bottom. You can just kind of barely make it out. Um, because then it, that 38th and Walnut would be a little bit more of a four-way intersection and that might be a good place to do an all-way stop, which would help support people walking um, safely getting across Walnut Street and help close that that large gap between um, dedicated pedestrian crossings. Is that something you considered? Uh, oh, right here? Yeah. No, I don't know if we've discussed that. 
Uh, I don't believe that's come up. We had, we're Charles or Edward. I don't think that's come up in our discussions. I don't recall it being something. It certainly is an applicant team. It's something you could look at. I don't know whether it would uh, meet the requirements for a multi-way, four-way stop. But um, there's not necessarily a code provision that would allow us to mandate it there. But we can certainly evaluate it. Uh, and the issue may be, just speaking from the engineering perspective, that it is the low point of the site on that side. So we're also trying to get great, uh, drainage. There's no storm in Walnut. So I could see that creating different hazards, not pedestrian directly, but icing and other concerns if we shift too far to the east. But something we can definitely, you know, confirm. Okay. Yeah, I think it's something we can look at. Daniel, do you have any comments on that? Uh, no, I mean, certainly I don't know the technicalities. We haven't looked at it. Uh, from a development standpoint, uh, it does affect uh, parking uh, sort of how the site is uh, efficient with its parking. We are uh, adjusting our parking to have a 25% parking reduction. Uh, so this would make a fairly inefficient parking, reducing substantially the uh, sort of our count. So that's the only thing that comes into mind, but more from a development. Uh, I don't know the particularities of uh, uh, what would happen to that intersection. Okay, thank you. I think it might also impact how you get that um, that truck in and out to the yes, and uh, <laughs> that's a really good point because uh, this is a life sciences building. Deliveries of uh, uh, are pretty critical, uh, and the safe deliveries are, are pretty critical to the to the operations of the project. So uh, we've studied this uh, substantially. In fact, uh, having the the multi use path to the north of our side, south of the railroad tracks, uh, has pushed us the limits of what we can actually do from a delivery standpoint. Okay. Thanks. Anything uh, else is, and that? I don't know if this is water quality here. Um, I think it is, but but yeah, it's, we, it's good looking, feedback. We can look at it. Yeah, we're looking at water quality in several points along the site, and I would I would just say the pedestrian crossings, if if that's a necessity too. Um, the, the and Edward, you can speak to this more, but per code, I think we can accommodate. We often try not to have drive access for private line up with public street um, without you know a lot of really intense signage and all of that but we can always accommodate the pedestrian crossings when they're not aligned um, to meet whatever requirements are needed so maybe we just keep that in mind as we continue through process as well okay anything else from tab Alex, um, at the risk of being, <clears throat> excuse me, too much in the weeds here, I'm just trying to make sure I uh, am tracking feedback we received from community cycles and what, what, um, how that tracks with, with this. So I think what we've seen, we got an email from community cycles on Saturday, tab, tab um, which says in part, community cycles strongly opposes limiting a connection at this location. However, we have seen updated plans which indicate the applicant will ask for an amendment to the TVAP connection plans, connections plan to change the street to a multi-use path. We would support such an amendment. And then there's a little bit more detail. And then a perfectly acceptable alternative to an underpass would be an at-grade signalized uh, multi-use multi -use path crossing of the tracks with quiet zone in infrastructure. Um, this might be cheaper. So I think that was what was reflected um, from the team to say no that's that's not going to work that's just prohibitive so do i have that right that that's what community cycle said the the proposal here is to say well sorry that's we unfortunately cannot accommodate that is that correct or more or less correct oh uh, yeah a trail at grade crossing isn't feasible uh, or i you know we even looked at you know putting stubbing out a crossing but that also has challenges because you're driving people to a railroad tracks without a crossing. And that has um, implications from a safety perspective. There's another location in town without a crossing where people are riding their bikes. And I, I mean, I don't know anyone that's done that, but um, you, you know, you, you huck your bike over the railroad tracks to continue on. And so we don't wanna create that situation where we know we can't get a crossing. So we were looking more 
at this north-south connectivity? And then how do we create circulation within our site so that people there's more, and this is gets into the site review criteria of how do we provide permeability and connectivity, but no, providing an at grade multimodal path seems impossible, both because we'd have to give up another at grade crossing somewhere else and a road would have to accompany that trail. And that's how I read the BNSF. They'll allow a trail if a road is built alongside it. Okay. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. That's what I thought. Um, I just, just my comment is this is a tough one because um, we have Community Cycles uh, knows this space pretty well, and they're saying hey, this this isn't doesn't work for them. Um, and the consultant saying, well, this and staff, I suppose, saying this is, you know, this is um, this is the way it looks to them. So my thought would be, you know, if there's anything that the uh, the proposal and the consultant team can do to, uh, I don't know, provide some mitigation. Maybe that's not the right word. Some um, additional measures to support with our mode shifting goals and making the streets safer and easier for cyclists and pedestrians. Um, I'd sure be happy to see that. Um, but that, that's all I have for now. Thank you. Okay. Brian, do you have anything in mind uh, as to what kind of support? Well, I, I'm not sure I'm the closest to this on either of the sides. I just, I just, you know, what I, I have a little bit of heartburn with community, you know, hearing just sort of a bit like a no <laughs> to, to our um, main, uh, you know, uh, bicycle safety out and street advocates in town. It, it'd be nice if there was some kind of, um, some kind of give back. I, I don't know what that is. I really don't so, know because I don't think I'm close to it. No, and uh, I appreciate that. From, from our standpoint, we really wanted this connection to work because the more connectivity for us, the better. Uh, in multiple ways, but it was just uh, technically unfeasible. And, uh, you know, we heard a lot of clear from uh, from BNSF and, and their guidelines that, that they don't allow these at great connections for all the reasons I'm not going to regurgitate. Um, on the other hand, we are making, uh, we are acknowledging the fact that uh, there's going to, there is in the TMP plan, uh, uh, multi-use path being planned that's going to go all along the rail and connecting to East Boulder. Uh, so we are supporting that and we are basically reserving and potentially building that, that path if that's what's necessary for us to, to do. Um, unlikely, and I think I heard this from, from Edward, is uh, in order for that trail to happen along the, the, the rail, they would have to actually buy all the property to connect it all the way to East Boulder. So I don't know what the likelihood of that is, uh, but in preparation for that and in support of that, uh, we'd be happy to reserve it and build it if necessary, if that's what you guys uh, want us to do. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks. Any more tab support or opposition to amending the TVAP connections plan? Becky? Just have one follow-up question on that, which is if I realize it would take a lot for ultimately this, this multi-use path along the railroad to be built um, adjacent to it, but um, if, if, if they were there, um, I saw on either side of the building, there's a pedestrian path and then there's the main road into the parking lot. So would somebody trying to access that multi-use path, like what would, how would they be expected to get there from Walnut street? Um, if they could, if they're a pedestrian, they could use a pedestrian path, but if they're on a bike, would they be allowed on that path or is it, would it be only for pedestrians? Would they be expected, could they not cross on the property at all to get to that path from Walnut? Um, Shannon and uh, or Tony or, or uh, I don't know that there are some uh, some challenges with that location and given a reservation. Uh, we understand that Excel that's uh, the easement that Excel needs in order to provide power to the building, uh, particularly along that side. That's not to say that we could consider it if that's something that you guys uh, feel pretty strongly about. Um, certainly we could consider a, a multi-use path uh, to connect to that portion of the, of the site or to create a reservation for the moment it gets built. Because uh, uh, certainly I would not like to spend that much money on something that might never happen and, and create a connection that might not ever happen. So uh, be certainly be open to uh, provide a reservation uh, to create that connection. Thanks, appreciate it. And uh, before, I, before I say that, I just wanna make sure I'm not speaking out of term. Uh, so I would like the our architects in, uh, in, uh, in JVA to, to, to tell us yeah. if that's even possible or not. Sharon, we might have you field this one in terms of width over there. Yeah, we shifted the building enough, Becky, so that 
because there is some nebulousness around what we will see through site review, we want to make sure that we can account for things that may come up. Um, there are a couple options on the west side where we could use and share space with Excel and utilities, as, as you were mentioning, Daniel. So I think it's more a question. I would hate to see concrete surround the entire site to provide multi-use path in a, a rectangle around the entire big U around the whole site because we can't get a true connective path from others. Um, but I think we're, we're prepped at least on the west and north side for the possibility of needing to provide a multi-use multi path in the event that there's problems. It's just something I'd prefer to see as reservation and not a design or a construct because it's a lot of carbon footprint, poor concrete that ultimately might not be, uh, you know, complete. So I think it's really important. Oh, I lost you at a critical moment there. Uh -oh. I wish I, I should be able to finish your sentence. It's really yeah. important that we look at it during site review. I think so we have allowed for that and the reservation would be split on both properties. And so, you know, it could be built in the future, but you got it. It also is, it's at the expense of, like I mentioned, driving people to railroad tracks that they can't cross and also landscaping and other things. So I think we want to balance all of that out and provide really good circulation through the, through the site review process. But we did, I can bring it, the screen back up, but we did move the building to allow for that future possibility. Thanks, Danica. Sorry if I broke out there at the end, good save. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, I appreciate the, the insight. Thanks, anything else from Tab? If not, thank you to staff and the, this large team of consultants. Um, I think we've learned a lot. Hopefully we've provided something useful for you as well. Yeah, we appreciate your time. Like I said, this is a, a new thing for many of us. So, but I do think it's an important step in the process to get your feedback early on before we start, like we said, before we start landing buildings and other important things. So we really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Next up, we have agenda item seven, which was just an information item. So, so no presentation about an update on Excel Energy Streetlight LED conversion. Did anyone on tab have any pressing thoughts or questions about that? If not, we'll look forward to seeing how that public process turns out in the months to come. And that brings us to matters first from staff. Think, oh, there we go. There it's coming. Nathan is with us, I believe. Yes. There. Good evening. Well, good evening, uh, members of TAB. I just have a couple of slides, and I'm here to give you a, a brief update on a project. My name is Nathan Pope. I'm a senior transportation planner, and I'm going to give you a, a brief progress update on the status of the State Highway 7 East Arapahoe Road multi-use path and transit stop project. As many of you know, this project is the first step in implementing the vision for the East Arapahoe Transportation Plan. This specific project fills in missing links along the multi-use path system and enhances bus stops along Arapahoe Avenue between 38th and Marine Streets and down to Cherryville Road. We last shared this project with you in September 2021 for a public hearing on the Community Environmental Assessment Process, or SEEP, which has since been approved. So a little background, um, just to make sure we're all on the same page, the city adopted the East Arapahoe Transportation Plan in 2018, and the plan sets out a long-range vision to create a regional multimodal corridor along State Highway 7 East Arapahoe with high quality and high frequency bus rapid transit, a regional bikeway, multi-use paths, and first and final mile supportive infrastructure. The elements of the East Arapahoe Transportation Plan are intended to be phased incrementally. This project will advance the near-term action items of the East Arapahoe Transportation Plan by addressing existing deficiencies, such as missing segments of the multi-use path, upgrading narrow sidewalks to City of Boulder standard multi-use path widths, widths, and upgrading transit stops that lack infrastructure, such as trash receptacles, benches, and shelters. In 2019, the City of Boulder applied for and received federal funding for this project, which has a total budget of $1.9 and is composed of federal and city transportation funds.
You'll remember that the preferred design option prioritizes the, cross, the desired cross-section of a 12-foot multi-use path and an eight-foot landscape buffer where, where it can be accommodated within the existing public right-of-way. In li limited segments of the corridor, the multi-use path narrows to 10 feet in width and the buffer width varies between two to eight feet to maximize improvements within the existing public right-of-way. Since, since the project was presented for a public hearing of the SEEP six months ago, staff have worked to incorporate comments we heard from TAB members. This includes focusing our limited resources on segments of the multi-use path that have the most need and not reconstructing usable path segments. Where possible, the design now keeps the existing path and adds color concrete to achieve the desired section, allowing us to stretch our dollars further. Staff have also worked to ensure that the design accommodates all future East Arapaho transportation plan projects to the extent possible. The team is finalizing the design and preparing to go to bid on the project. The project is currently slated to begin construction in spring or summer of 2023, pending undergrounding of the, ex of the overhead utilities by Excel. As the team finalizes, finalizes the design, we are happy to hear any additional comments and questions from TAB. And that's, for, that's the end of my update. Thank you so much for your time and we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks, Nathan. I think one thing we discussed a while back was if it was necessary, I'm glad to hear that there's some segments that are gonna be preserved because they were deemed usable. There was some discussion a while back about if there's a need right now to extend the multi-use path on the south side of Arapaho as it goes east towards the golf course because once you reach the golf course, there's not more multi-use path. And so it'd be upgrading a, a sidewalk to a multi-use path. You, is that something that's included or, or not included in the scope of this? Um, I'm gonna hand off to Brian Bulcher, who's the project manager and can answer that on um, that specific question. Brian, do you have a uh, answer on that part? That exact segment? Yeah, thanks, Nathan. Uh, hi, Alex, uh, good question. Um, so we, do not uh, reconstruct east of uh, 55th. We, we do infill some of the uh, cobble to make it a little bit more of a usable sidewalk, but we do not reconstruct or uh, widen the path uh, much to the east. We do have a transit stop on that south side um, to try to accommodate. So we wanted to make sure that we could accommodate that, but no, we did not reconstruct all the way to the golf course. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. I think on this roadway, when the bus, you mentioned the buses, when they when they are stopping, they're typically going to be stopping at street level and then we're gonna have a multi-use path. And so we won't in most places have a conflict between buses that are pulling over to pick people up and people who might be traveling on bike with the exception of the stop at the golf course, there's no sidewalk or multi-use path there. And then similarly, there's a, this is in the, the eastbound direction. So eastbound at the golf course, there's no sidewalk or multi-use path. And so it's possible that the bus will be pulling over and kind of blocking the path of a cyclist. And then similarly at eastbound at Old Tail Road, there's again, the possibility of a bus blocking the path of a cyclist. Um, does the design include something like a floating bus stop or something that would prevent a, a bus from stopping in the bikeway like they do today? Are you referring to the uh, stop in front of the golf course um, on kind of the south side there? Yeah, the two south side eastbound stops, the, the one at the golf course and then the one at Old Tail Road. Uh, the, the one at the golf course, we are not currently um, doing anything with. Uh, that was kind of outside the limits of our project. The uh, other eastbound stop at Old Tail that you're referring to, um, we are making a kind of dedicated connection where the bus can pull over, um, but it would have to pull over to the uh, side stop to, to get to that point. So in both cases, it, the bus stopping would probably block the path of a cyclist. You're talking about a cyclist on the street? Yeah, because there's no sidewalk or, or multi-use path along the, the golf course. Correct, yes. Okay, if, if possible, and budget allows some sort of simple floating bus stop at those locations, I think would help ensure that people can feel 
safe getting across this stretch that, that doesn't provide as much infrastructure as, as the rest of the corridor. Yeah, that's I, I think we can take a look at that. Thanks. Any other questions or feedback from Tab? All right. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you. And it looks like Chris Haglund's here for a curbside management update on pilot projects. Yes. Uh, good evening, Tab. Chris Haglund, Principal Planner. Let me uh, share my screen. Uh, I am also joined by Allison Moore Farrell, um, our Senior Transportation Planner, and uh, helping with the curbside management project and leading the pilot project phase of that, which is what we'll be talking about today. Right. Seeing the presentation correctly? All right, thank you. So once again, we're, uh, we're pleased to come to you tonight to give you an update on curbside management and specifically kind of where we are in looking at the design uh, and implementation of pilot projects for this. Um, so just kind of what we wanted to share with you tonight is just, again, since we do have some new TAB members um, or new-ish, I would say, uh, we want to give a brief uh, overview of the curbside management project. And then we want to get into some of the pilot project concepts that we're working on. And then any discussion input from TAB would be helpful. And then we can share our next steps as well. So why manage the curb? You know, the curb is a, a very important resource. It's a public resource with a growing number of competing uh, demands, uh, especially new demands most recently, and it is a limited supply. So we need to figure out how we want to best organize and, and manage that curb. The curb is really the front door to a number of destinations uh, for our residents and employees and visitors. Uh, and it's a important uh, location for that connection between transportation options. Um, what's really interesting is we've been talking to our University Hill Commission and our Downtown Commission is, is really the, the fact that commerce is changing, how people conduct business, how they receive goods and services is changing. And a lot of that is happening at the curb. Uh, we've seen tremendous growth of transportation network companies such as Uber and Lyft uh, with increased online shopping. We've seen a, a, a tremendous increase in package delivery, UPS, Amazon, FedEx, all of those. Uh, and we're also seeing uh, a lot of the food delivery services such as DoorDash. So the way in which commerce is happening is changing and, and we need to adapt to that on how we manage the curb to best uh, promote that efficiency of commerce, but also uh, look at safety uh, as well. And we're going to use um, this tool to help also, of course, uh, work towards our community goals. Uh, the curbside is used for a huge variety of purposes. You know, historically, vehicle storage and short-term parking is, is probably one of the main ones, as, can, uh, as you'll be able to see in our existing conditions report that will be coming out. Uh, but there is a variety of other ways in which the curb is used uh, related to micromobility or electric vehicle charging. Uh, and a lot of it is related to freight and loading zones and how these are used. And, and once again, like the TNC pick up and drop off. Uh, ADA access. So there's a variety of demands placed on the curb. And so this project is really looking at developing a set of policies and then an implementation guidebook to help uh, city staff guide uh, how we use the curb and how we respond to any requests for changes on how the curb is designated as well. Um, just a, a brief update on kind of what's happened so far uh, since we last updated TAB. Um, we have published our best practices report that's been published online and on the Access Allies websites. Um, we're right in the process of finalizing the existing conditions report. All the staff feedback has um, been given. We're just going to have our consultants update it, and then we're going to pass it on to leadership for the, the final review. So that hopefully will be done fairly soon. And, and then we've been really working on the pilot projects. We've been doing a lot of outreach uh, to uh, 
boards and commissions on getting some ideas and input for, you know, what are the needs, what are the opportunities, what are the limitations for how we adjust how the curb is, is used uh, in, in the downtown and the University Hill specifically. Um, just uh, last week, we met with UCAMP C, which is the University Hill Commission, uh, to discuss these pilot po projects in University Hill and had a, a great amount of feedback. Uh, after this meeting uh, tonight, tomorrow night, we're going to the Downtown Management Commission uh, to do the same types of things. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it over to Allison, who is leading our efforts on the pilot projects. Great, thank you, Chris, um, for that introduction. So as we're identifying the pilot project locations and really getting into the specifics, I'll go over um, what we're looking at for the um, different pilot categories. So first we have the transportation network company staging area. So your Uber and Lyft and um, looking at pickup and drop off zones um, for Uber and Lyft. And we identified some issues and opportunities um, here and primarily regarding unsafe movements um, in the travel lane. And we noticed this um, through observations um, as well as data collection that we've done um, in the in the three commercial districts that we're studying. Um, and these pilot projects um, we're looking at, like Chris mentioned, in the downtown and University Hill District. Um, other kind of um, issues with transportation network companies that we've um, noticed is cruising fine passengers, which is increasing BMT and GHG emissions in our commercial districts. So um, looking at some um, using these pilots as opportunities to address those with staging areas. And we'll show a map of, of the areas we're considering for that and kind of looking at the different circulation within these areas that would be most appropriate for TNC staging areas. Another pilot category that we're digging into is flexible loading zones. And this is going to address a lot more of the delivery concerns. As we've noticed in the past few years, um, deliveries have increased with um, not only um, more traditional deliveries like UPS and Amazon, but we're having Uber Eats and a, and a lot of these um, um, dynamic companies that are, are coming in and utilizing these zones. So we're looking at really streamlining these zones so that it's um, a lot more simplified and easy to use for each of the users. Um, and then looking at how that will increase safety in these loading and unloading zones for all users um, and reducing collisions and conflicts in those zones, as well as traffic delay and congestion, um, and really trying to understand that behavior better so that we can adapt um, as we move forward. So recognizing that this is a really dynamic um, space on the curb and, and figuring out how we can respond best to that and, and be flexible in that moving forward. So. Um, that's what we're looking at with these um, two different pilot idea categories. And um, like Chris mentioned, we're looking in the downtown and University Hill area, um, which we'll, we'll look at maps on the next few slides. And the time frame we're looking for is a three to four month um, pilot time frame. So we're looking at starting in late August and going through November or December. So Chris, if you can move forward to the maps. Thank you. So here are some of the locations we're looking at for the University Hill pilot projects. And like Chris mentioned, we went to the um, University Hill Commission last week and spoke with them about these locations. Um, and CU had shared that Lot 65 would, would not be an appropriate spot, but we discussed with um, the commission a couple other locations that could work for um, TNC staging. So we're looking at kind of some circulation issues with with those locations and then working with Uber and Lyft to look at the feasibility of that. So um, recognizing that this is a location that, that uses a lot of TNCs. Um, and then along 13th Street and a little bit along College, you'll see right there is where we're looking at for the flexible loading zones. Um, and it's, no, it's important to note here, it's not taking away parking on the street. This is, um, this is reimagining some of the existing loading zones that um, that have different amounts of time and, and kind of different direction and, and that sort of thing. So we're, we're looking at making them more flexible, but not taking away parking on this specific, um, this specific spot. And then next up, we have some locations um, in downtown, again, still kind of narrowing down exactly where, but um, kind of a similar idea of recognizing where TNCs are most prevalent and looking at appropriate circulation 
um, in the downtown area based on that and um, you know, looking at the origin and destination of those TNCs and, and figuring out how we can best meet the needs of, of users for that. Um, and then looking at those flexible loading zones as well, where it's most appropriate um, in the downtown district. So these are the locations that we're looking at. Um, and really what we would really appreciate from you is um, asking any, um, you know, clarifying questions from the um, from the concepts of these pilot ideas. Again, we're still narrowing down exactly um, the locations and we may kind of combine some of them or, or reduce a few of those um, if, if they're not making sense for the concepts. But um, if you have any clarifying questions about those, those two primary concepts of the TNC staging and the flexible loading zones, um, we'd be happy to clarify as we're moving forward with the design of those pilot projects. And here are just some of the locations listed for clarification. Thanks. And the in, oh, go, ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was going to open up for discussion. Thank you for this this overview. I, I think these are interesting concepts to explore. Seeing this just for the first time right now, no no immediate feedback from me on the the specific locations. Um, but it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how it performs and it'll, especially as a user seeing what it's like um, with the pickup and drop off, I'll, I'll look forward to experiencing that. Certainly, and, and we'll share with you, you know, when it is kicked off. So, so we'd, we'd love your feedback as a user um, of the space. And I know it's a lot of locations to kind of, um, you know, process right now on the spot. But um, again, if you have any questions about the concept and as a whole um, for the pilots, that's also helpful. Yeah, thanks. Tab, anyone have anything? If not, we'll just we'll just wait to check it out. All right. I, I just gotta uh, just run run by some of the next steps uh, before we finish up. So we do have the existing conditions report that's in the final process of review. This looks at um, our three general areas of Boulder Junction, Uni Hill, and Caged, and this will. How, how we're currently using the curbside. So this report will be out soon and we'll, we'll pass this on. Um, as Allison said, for the pilot project, what we're, what we're really doing is right now, we're just kind of in, in the process of identifying what and where. Uh, soon we will start on the actual design of how these flexible loading zones and TNC uh, staging areas will work. Uh, we'll develop an, an engagement plan and communication plan. Um, there's a lot of players involved. We've got to talk to property owners. We've got to talk to um, the delivery providers, the TNCs, to really have them integrated into this pilot project so we can learn from them and see what they need uh, and respond. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to the DMC uh, tomorrow. Uh, next week, we have our check-in with the Access Allies, where uh, we have tab members on that access allies so will dive a little deeper into the actual uh, pilot areas that we're looking at and kind of what we're thinking. Uh, then we will we have a information information item going to council just to alert them and, and keep them in the know that pilot projects are being designed and they will be implemented. Um, and you know we never want to catch them unaware so they'll be provided an update. We are looking at the implementation of these pilot projects probably in late August. Uh, there will be some baseline data collection that will take place before implementation as well. So we'll be doing that. And uh, we can certainly return to TAB uh, in, in August or in September, depending on where we are in that process, to give you a real final update on, on what we're going to be implementing in terms of the pilot projects, but also how we're going to evaluate their effectiveness as well. And that's our update. Thanks, Chris. All right. Anything else from Tab? All right, appreciate it. Have a good night. All right, Natalie, do you have a e-bike rebate program update? I do. 
Um, so Alex had just asked me to give an update from council. We had a discussion, I guess, a couple weeks ago now um, with council about potentially doing an e-bike rebate program pilot this year. Um, and I think most of you kind of have the background on where the idea came from and whatnot. Um, ultimately, council decided, you know, given that it would have taken some staff resources and we would have needed to shift things to accommodate that this year, they decided not to pursue a not a five to um, amend our work plan in 2022. We are doing some legwork this year just to um, be able to potentially go after something in 2023. I, I noted, and um, if you guys have more questions, Valerie's here and she can speak to this as well. Um, but there's some state funding that's going to be available later this year. And so we'll certainly be looking to pursue that. Um, and that will set us up nicely to be able to um, hopefully initiate a program in 2023. So we're certainly thinking about it and we're, um, we'll be getting into work planning for 2023 here soon in the next couple months. And um, that'll be a part of those discussions. Thanks, Natalie. Mm -hmm. I know, Ryan, you helped kick this off. Here's what you have. To thanks. Get. Yeah, thanks, Alex. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Natalie. Um, I don't have um, anything else to say other than um, maybe, Natalie, I could just try a, a kind of a, a message on implications and then you could help correct me. Um, okay. I, I think that, um, first of all, people should go buy e-bikes now. There's no, <laughs> don't, don't wait because there's no, there's no program. Um, and, and so, and we, you know, I will continue to you know pursue and try to support the, uh, anything I can, such that the city would would in the future have e bike incentive program. But we um, there's no reason as a as a consumer as a, as a buyer right now to think oh this is like around the corner because if it, you know it would it would need to go through process again and you know right. folks will know about that. So um, good point. Don't don't wait if you're thinking on on getting an e bike. Right. <laughs> Nothing certain so. Don't wait. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Ryan. Anything else from Tab? I appreciate it. I think Danny might have a zero fare for better error update from RTD. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, so good evening again, Tab. Uh, Danny O'Connor, Principal Transportation Planner, Transit Program Manager. Um, just wanted to take a moment to give you a quick um, update related to a transit announcement. Uh, so for during the entire month of August, RTD will offer zero fares across its system as part of its zero fare for better air initiative. Um, this initiative is made possible by Colorado Senate Bill 22180 in partnership with the Colorado Energy Office and is designed to reduce ground level ozone by increasing use of public transit. Um, so current RTD customers will also benefit as they will not have to use or purchase fare products throughout all of August to ride. And uh, zero fare will also apply to the city's hop service all throughout August. Um, so in just as some context, as uh, many of you may be aware, uh, the 2019 TMP really recommends that zero fare transit services as a strategy. It's specifically called out as, um, you know, a strategy to enhance equity and as well to reduce GHGs through bolstering ridership. So uh, we are very excited to see this initiative take flight and hopefully lead to expanded conversations and offerings for zero fare in the future. Um, the city's communications team is uh, working to prepare messaging on this. Um, there's a whole host of messaging that RTD has um, set up and it's all going to go out kind of in a public campaign starting July 15th and our city comms will be um, um, augmenting that and uh, working through those channels as well out in the community to really to, to push this. Um, so really, I mean, just to give more of a plug, if you haven't been on transit lately, August will be a great and easy time to use local and regional um, transit for, for any of your trips and really kind of get a firsthand uh, experience of how the system is functioning and how it has changed, especially after the service and ridership impacts of COVID. 
August is also one of those months uh, where we really see ridership grow as uh, students return to school, um, more commute activities occur. And as mentioned, this is one of our, our, our big ozone months as far as the region. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, anything you can do to help promote um, uh, August zero fare, we, we'd appreciate. Um, and then please stay tuned as staff is planning some additional activities in the in the upcoming months for TAB and the community to, that will build upon the Zero Fair August to further highlight and discuss transit initiatives in the community. Uh, I heard interest earlier in electrification. I think that's that's obviously one, one topic we'd love to further discuss coming up. So um, thank you so much and happy to entertain any questions. Thanks, Danny. I hadn't heard about this. This is a Great program and welcome news when others are talking about things like gas tax holidays. This hopefully, as a, a more sustainable solution, and like you alluded to, hopefully get some people some exposure to transit and might create some some new riders even after the, the end of August. Yeah, um, and you know I think what will be interesting too, just as a plug, is you know RTD is uh, you know we'll be actively really tracking kind of some of the trends that, that are occurring with zero fare so that will that'll be good um and it's it's looking back at previous months it's looking back at previous august you know and, and granted uh, covid's been a, a major disruptor for for transit but um really you know as the fall semester comes and as you know a lot of um kind of a, another return to work is opening up you know it, we're really interested to see what will happen um this august and it's also programmed for next august according to that senate bill so Awesome. Anything from Tab? Thanks, Danny. Thanks. Cool. Natalie, are there any other matters from staff? Nope. All right. Matters from the board. Our first retreat, we didn't quite get to Tab priorities and a real Tab retreat. So I think we have a second part coming soon. Meredith, do you have the date for that? I think, oh, Tuesday, the August 9th from 2.30 to 5 p.m. Does that still work for all TAB members that are here tonight? Awesome. I'll uh, chat with Natalie and we'll figure out what the agenda is going to be and hopefully we can share that with everyone in, in advance of the retreat. Yeah, I um, will just say I talked to Heidi today and I told her that we'd be reaching out once we confirm the date tonight. Um, we'd be reaching out to organize the agenda. Sounds good. Yeah. Any open board comment? None. Awesome. <laughs> any any future agenda topics that, that aren't on here that, that people would like to to get on our radar as we as we work on our, our scheduling in the coming months. I'll just say the um, for the August meeting, we are still working on the police department item provision zero. So um, I believe that will get added, but we just have a bit more internal work to confirm. OK, thanks. No one has anything else. I'll, uh entertain a motion to adjourn. Looks like Trini got it. I'll second that. All those in favor? Unanimous. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks, have a good night. Thanks. 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 Thanks.